Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Eric Carlson, Dollar. Oh, hello, Mr. Carlson. What can I do for you? If you're free, take an assignment. Oh, I'm free. Fine. Atlas Indemnity insures most of the independent diamond traders. You know, they're the little fellows who buy and sell on the sidewalks along New York's Diamond Row. Well, in the past six months, nearly two-thirds of them have canceled their insurance. Somebody offering a less expensive policy? No, they're suddenly going broke. Some of them after 20 and 30 years of trading. And I'm to find out why? Exactly. For a starter, you might see E.G. Moss. He's president of the Independent Diamond Traders Association. I'll get right on it, Mr. Carlson. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Atlas Indemnity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the independent diamond traders matter. Expense account item one, $21.30, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. At Grand Central, I phoned the Independent Diamond Traders Association and was told by the secretary that E.G. Moss could see me in half an hour. Outside, the city was being powdered clean and white by a late afternoon snowfall. So I indulged in the luxury of a stroll to the association's 47th Street headquarters. They were on the second floor of a converted brownstone. I was a few minutes early when I entered the dingy, deserted reception room. The secretary was absent from her desk, but the boss's door had been carelessly left ajar. Just enough to allow some strictly extracurricular business to filter out. Susan, 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 I'm sick to death of the name. She runs your life, Edgar, like she runs this office. But dearest. Why the traders ever elected you their president, I can't imagine. A man who can't even protect his own interests against a selfish snip of a stepdaughter. That is enough, Mona. What did you say? Bye. Dearest, please. No, I I, I didn't mean Let that. me no, go. Mona, I, I spoke in haste, dearest. Yes, dear. Forgive me. Edward, my maker. Say you will forgive me. Perhaps. Maybe. Now. Edward, please. My hair, I'll look a wreck. But I can't let you go like this. Anger between us. Then we see tonight in the family. All right. I'll, I'll think of something to tell Susan. I'm sure you will. Goodbye, Edward. No, no, not through the reception. Eavesdropping is a despicable oh, habit, Mr. Dollar. Me. Oh, hello. I, uh, didn't hear you come in. That is obvious. That door was open when I walked in here. You might have made your presence known to Mr. Moss. Well, I'll confess it occurred to me... I'll tell my father... Mr. Moss, you're here. Okay. Have it your way. Ah, Susan, you are back with my sandwiches and tea. Good, good. My stomach complains that it is past tea time and I... Oh, I I didn't know we had a visitor. This is Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Uh, Mr. Dollar? From the insurance company. Atlas Indemnity. He phoned me just before I went up for your tea party. Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course. H- how do you do, Mr. Dollar? Hello, Mr. Moss. <laughs> Forgive me, please, for being so addle headed So many things on my mind today. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, come into my office, Mr. Dollar, please. Uh, make yourself comfortable. Uh, that chair, I think you will find, is relaxing. Oh, thank you. Cigar? 
No, no, thanks. Then perhaps tea. There is enough for both of us, and some of these small sandwiches, they're delicious. No, thanks. You go ahead, though. <laughs> of course, tea from a paper carton can hardly be compared with the delicate aroma of tea brewed in a china pot. Now, Mr. Moss, if you don't mind, I'd like to get directly to the reason for this call. I am so sorry, Mr. Dollar. I, I'm rambling again, as Susan says. <laughs> Susan is my stepdaughter, Mr. Dollar. A lovely girl, do you not agree? Very lovely, Mr. Moss. And now if you... She volunteers her services here at the association since we can no longer afford to pay a secretary. I understand more than two-thirds of your membership have gone out of business. Yes, that is true. Friends and associates, men I have grown to respect and admire over the past 30 years. One by one, selling what stones they have, leaving the street for... Who knows where? Why, Mr. Moss? Didn't your company give you the details, Mr. Dollar? I have had considerable correspondence with your Mr. Uh, uh, Eric Carlton. Uh, yes. He, he wrote me he was planning to send someone to assist the association. I thought surely he would have pleased you. Well, Carlson gave me the basic situation, but he said that you'd fill me in. Oh, yes, I see, I see. Now, tell me, in your opinion, what or who is forcing these small traders out of business? Prices, of course. When suddenly a diamond worth a thousand dollars can be purchased for eight hundred dollars, the small trader is the first to get hurt. Yeah, go on. The members of our association have their modest capital invested in diamonds at long established market prices, Mr. Dollar. As you know, the diamond market is rigidly controlled, and there was little or no fluctuation until recently. And then? From some source, diamonds were poured upon the market at far below the normal price. Any idea where these cut-rate stones are coming from, Mr. Moss? None. Obviously, if I did have, I would take action. I see. Well, thanks, Mr. Moss. I won't take any more of your time. What are you going to do, Mr. Dollar? Oh, ask questions around the big trading houses. Try to find out who's selling the stones at bargain basement prices and... How the seller is able to cut such a slice off the normal price. The association would be very grateful, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye, Mr. Moss. Goodbye, sir. And thank you. <clears throat> yes? Any chance of burying the hatchet, Miss Carla? You seem to be very anxious to save face, Mr. Dollar. Look, I said I was sorry. I was listening and you caught me cold. But uh, considering the dialogue that was coming out of your father's office, wouldn't you have listened? Well, I suppose Daddy is a little silly over that woman. And maybe I did leave his door ajar. I accept your apology. Hey, I didn't apologize. I said maybe I left his door ajar. Now who's trying to save face? I didn't apologize. Shall we call it a draw? <laughs> You're very persuasive, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye, Susan. It was after six, and the larger merchants along Diamond Row were closed. For convenience, I checked into a small hotel around the corner from Moss's office, sent for my bag at the station, and went out to dinner. Expense account item two, three dollars and five cents. Note, I don't want this to set a precedent in low dinner tabs. I just wasn't hungry. Well, the charm of the first snowfall had now palled on me, so I bought some papers and returned to the hotel. Oh, yes, sir? 318, please. Uh, 318? Oh, Mr. Dollar, oh, forgive me, I didn't oh, recognize you. that's all right. You. You've only seen me once before. Oh, yes, of course, but that certainly is no excuse. It just seems that lately I... Oh, my. There I go again. There's a package for you. A package? Yes, I have it here. Uh, no. No, that's not it. Oh, yes. Yeah. I hear it. There you are, sir. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Were you on duty when this was delivered? Uh, Mr. Dollar, with the exception of Wednesdays, I am on duty every day. From 8 in the morning until noon. And from 4 until midnight. <laughs> And since this is Tuesday, obviously... Now, about this package, who delivered it? Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I just can't... I just... Oh, my, 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 my. I just can't help it. Well, as a matter of fact, I must have dozed off. I, I found it on the desk about, uh, about ten minutes ago. 
I see. May I have my key, please? 318. I went up to my room and opened the package. Inside was a card which bore the inscription Mona. And nestling in black velvet, a pair of diamonds. Ten carats each, if my amateur eye was any judge. Johnny Dollar. This is Mona, Mr. Dollar. Mona? Well, I don't quite know what to say. (laughs) You received the package, I gather. Yeah, I received it. Interested in the contents? Oh, tremendously. I thought you would be, considering your business with Edgar Moss this afternoon. How do you know about that? I'll explain when I see you. Oh? I can help you, Mr. Dollar. How? I happen to know who's flooding the market with cut-rate diamonds. Who? Suppose you meet me tonight at 8 at the Surf and Sand Club. Tell you then. Hello? Hello? Mona? The Surf and Sand was a new night spot on the north shore of Long Island. I ran up expense account item three, $6.50, including tip, to square things with a taxi meter that had all the symptoms of a doped racehorse. The interior of the club was sleek and candlelit, with aquariums of tropical fish wherever you looked and very few customers to admire them. I decided to wait for my date at the bar. Uh, Good evening, sir. Much pleasure. A lady named Mona, bartender. You know her? I know several Mona, sir. Well, lucky you. The Mona blonde, brunette, or so-so? I couldn't say. Hmm? Blind date? Mm Mm-hmm. And she has a voice that's more than just a voice. What lady named Mona has not A very astute observation. Now, maybe you'd construct me a nice bourbon and... Hey, suddenly the horizon brightened. (laughs) You mean that redhead standing in the foyer? Very decorative. No hobby for a man with a weak constitution. You know her? Oh, she comes in now and then. Seems to be looking for someone. You know who? I imagine you. What? Her name's Mona. Oh, why didn't you say so sooner? (laughs) Hello, Mona. Hello. I'm Johnny Dollar. Yes, I know. I saw you at the bar. Why didn't you come over? Or uh, are you waiting for someone else? Just you, Johnny. My car's outside. Let's drive somewhere. Well, this is my first ride in a Mercedes. Sounds like there's a captive hurricane under the hood. (laughs) You like my little car, Johnny? Mm Mm-hmm. Tell me, is that speedometer scale optimistic, or can this car really do 120 miles an hour? I don't know. Let's try it. Oh, hey, never mind. I was only curious. Well, I'm curious, too, Johnny. Have you lost your mind? Slow down. Why, the highway's deserted. I like to drive fast. Mona. Oh, Johnny. Why did you switch off the ignition? Are you afraid? You bet I'm afraid. Now promise to keep your heel off the accelerator and I'll turn on the ignition. All right. I'm sorry, Johnny. I acted on impulse. I like to act on impulse. Was it impulse that prompted you to send me those diamonds tonight? No. Now what then? I wanted to arouse your curiosity. Why? Because we hadn't met before. Oh, talk sense, Mother. Well, I just couldn't think of any other way to make certain you'd keep a blind date. And you just happen to have a pair of 10-carat diamonds with RSVP carved on them. I can afford it. Well, a quick look at this car and that sable you're wearing. I'm inclined to believe you can. I like expensive things. Let's talk about cut-rate diamonds. You said on the phone you could help me. You know who's selling them? I do. But Captain LeDrew will tell you. Captain LeDrew? That's where I'm taking you now. To meet him. Why didn't he come to the club with you? He didn't care to take the risk. The risk? Captain McGrew is wanted by the police. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time, even when you're busy working 
You can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. A lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. the rest of the ride north on the Jones Beach Highway, Mona kept the Mercedes at a sane speed and the talk to trifles. When we finally stopped, it was before a ramshackle beach cottage. He's inside. What took you so long, Mona? I've been waiting an hour. Johnny, uh, Mr. Dollar doesn't like to drive fast, Captain LeDrew. Uh, everything okay? He was alone. No one followed him. Would you mind telling me what this is all about? Sit down, Dollar. Pour him a drink, Mona. I'll skip the drink. Then sit down. I sure? I'll come right to the point, Dollar. I'm sailing tonight, out of the country. Bon voyage. Don't waste my time with your attempted humor. Up to now, my time has been wasted. Several hours of it. Now, let's get down to cases, Captain. Mona said you'd tell me who's dumping cut-rate diamonds. I am, Dollar. Oh. I smuggled them into the country. That's my business. Rackets, you mean. Johnny, be smart. Just listen. Like I said, smuggling is my business. Diamonds. I don't pay taxes. I don't pay custom duty. And you can undersell the legitimate dealers and still show a whopping profit, huh? This is my last trip to the States. The market's oversupplied, but I have one final contract to fulfill. How does all this concern me? You're going to make the delivery for me, Dollar. Tonight. Me? You've already been paid. More than you scratch out of a hundred insurance cases. Oh, the two sparklers Mona sent. I sent. The card was my contribution, Johnny. It made all the difference, Mona. That's enough, Dollar. I was only expressing my appreciation, Captain. Johnny, shut up, will you? I'm losing my patience, Dollar. Likewise, LeDrew. Here are the diamonds you sent me. Get another boy. Sit down. I figured you for a gun, LeDrew. You're the type. Then you're smart enough to know I'll use it. Tell me, why pick on me to make your delivery? The customs officials on to you? They've got my customers staked out, cops all over the place. And so you two don't dare show your faces, huh? We prefer not to take the risk, Johnny. But the delivery must be made, Dollar. It's the biggest lot of stones yet. And suppose I refuse. <laughs> don't talk like a little tin hero, Dollar. You don't want me to kill you. Now, what's the difference whether I get killed here or by the customs men while I'm trying to slip through their stakeout? No, you just haven't convinced me, LeDrew. Get on your feet, Dollar. Why? Because I'm going to convince you. As I got to my feet, I expected LeDrew to start convincing me with the butt of his revolver. But I guessed wrong. He motioned me out the back way and onto a small boat dock. Mona followed. At the end of the dock was a low-slung cabin cruiser. We went below and into a plush carved mahogany lounge. Mm-hmm. Very fancy, Captain. Takes me where I want to go. Bought it from an oil man. He was tired of it. Sit down, Dollar. Thank you. Mona, bring him in. All right, darling. You can come out now. Moss. Mr. Dollar. Oh, thank heaven you are here. I'm afraid Mr. Moss is a little unnerved just now, Johnny, and rather disillusioned in me. My Edgar. Mr. Dollar, for heaven's sake, help me. Do whatever they ask. I think he'll help you, Mr. Moss. What do you say now, Dollar? Suppose I still say no. Johnny, you don't want to have Mr. Moss's death on your conscience, do you? Oh, it's like that, huh? I have a lot at stake, Dollar. I'll do what I have to. Let's leave them alone, Captain. To talk it over. Okay. Johnny? Yeah? Be smart. 
Don't try and do it. I'm touched by your concern, Mona. I'm coming. All right, Moss, let's have it. How did you ever get into this jam? Mona, she led me on. I, I was foolish enough to believe that she... She... Oh, never mind. I can guess the rest. Mr. Dollar, you have got to do what they ask. You can't let them kill me. You can't. Get hold of yourself, Moss. But you must do what they say. They, they, they mean to kill me if you refuse, and you too. They will kill you too. Take it easy. Do you think there is a chance to escape? The name is Dollar, not Houdini. There's only one exit onto the dock, and it's being covered by a 38. Oh, then you must do what they ask, Mr. Dollar. Use your head. There's not a chance in a million that I can get past those customs men. Yes, yes, there is. They have a plan. What? I heard them talking about how you could make the delivery. Yeah, how? Everything settled, Dollar? No, nothing's settled. You think I'd go for a deal like that? You came here tonight, didn't you? Yeah, I suppose my sanity can be questioned on that score. Don't rub it in, Captain. Johnny was curious. Well, who wouldn't be? Diamonds left at my hotel. A blind date with a voice that would melt a marble saint. Oh. Always was a sucker for a mystery. And a chase, Johnny. <laughs> you decided to cooperate, Dollar? Yes, yes, he has. Don't rush me, Mr. Moss. First, I'll have to hear more about that plan you overheard. There's a chance. Well, under the circumstances, maybe I'll try to make the delivery. <laughs> now you're being smart. Let's hear your plan. It's very simple. You phone my client. Tell him who you are and why the insurance company sent you to New York. Yeah, and? You insist on seeing him tonight. You say you're interviewing all the big diamond merchants, Johnny, to get their opinions on why the market has fallen so suddenly. Why don't I just tell your customer the real reason I want to see him? Now you're being wise again, Dollar. Johnny, you know the customs officials will have our client's phone tapped. They'll be listening to every word. And you figure they'll make a quick check with Atlas Indemnity. When they learn I was sent down here on legitimate business, they'll let me into your client's place unmolested. That's it, Dollar. Well, I've got to admit, it sounds plausible enough. It will work. They won't bother a guy with your reputation. That's why we've had you shadowed since you left your apartment in Hartford. I'm overwhelmed by the honor. Of course, you happen to enter the case at exactly the right moment. Oh, now you've spoiled it, Mona. Here's the envelope I want you to deliver, Dollar. You'll bring back another envelope. Suppose I bring back the police. From topside, I can see the highway for a mile in both directions. I'll put to sea the second I spot anything that remotely resembles a cop. Mr. Moss will sail with us, of course. Mr. Dollar, please don't involve the police, please. Relax, Moss, relax. Okay, LeDrew, you've got yourself a patsy. But what guarantee do I have that Moss and I will be freed when I get back from this job? Why, Johnny, you have the captain's word, of course. Lucky me. Mona drove me to the nearest gas station where I phoned LeDrew's client. The voice on the other end of the wire was irritated and uncooperative, but I insisted and finally got an okay for a personal interview. Next, I phoned for a cab, and 20 minutes later was dropped at the gate of a swank Plandome estate. I paid off the cabbie, expense account item four, $3.50, and went inside. No one stopped me, and I made the delivery without a hitch. The Drew's client gave me the money, and I ran up expense account item five, $3.80, cab fare back to the beach cottage. On the dock, I found that LeDru was indeed prepared to put to sea at the slightest sign of a double cross. The cruiser was straining on a short bow line, pulled away from the pier by the tide, the engines throbbing. That's far enough, Dollar. Freeze. Hey, take that light out of my eyes. Hover, Dollar. Keep your hands in sight. I didn't bring a gun, if that's what you're looking for. Smart of you. Where's the money? Under a dozen yards of adhesive. I'm papered with it from my waist to my neck. What's the idea? Your client felt there was still danger of my being stopped and searched. All right, get aboard. I'd rather be unwrapped in the cottage. Get aboard. Easy on the spine with a gun, will you? Move. Jump aboard, Dollar. 
Are you kidding? Even if I weren't taped up, I doubt if I could make that jump. Give you a hand on that line. Ledru made his last mistake. As he bent over to pull in the bow line, I released the line from the mooring bit, pushed him into the water, and jumped for the boat at the same time. He snapped a shot at me on his way down, but I was well aboard by then. Mona, the picture of frustration, went charging up and down the dock, looking for something with which to retrieve her floundering partner and yelling incantations at me in a voice far from sultry. I went into the wheelhouse, set the wheel to drift for what I judged to be the center of the bay, and was turning for the door when... Relax, Mr. Dollar. Morris. Don't move or I'll shoot. What is this? A surprise twist, I think it is called. You see, Ledru, Mona, and I are associates. And I'm a prize sap. Oh, don't be too hard on yourself, Mr. Dollar. I thought I was very convincing as the deceived suitor, the frightened hostage. You fooled me, Moss. The deception was necessary to enlist your cooperation. We knew you could never be hired to make that delivery, Mr. Dollar. Your <laughs> professional ethics being what they are. So you staged that little lover spat I overheard in your office this afternoon, huh? Mona thought it would quicken your interest, make my supposed betrayal more plausible. What about your stepdaughter? she mixed up in this business, too? Susan knows nothing about any of this. Keep away, Dollar. You better make the first shot count, Morton. Uh, your reflexes are a little slow, Moss. I used the ship's radio telephone to contact the police. And that Mercedes, Mona and LeDru weren't hard to find. The rest you've already read in the papers, Mr. Carlson. Moss, LeDru, and Mona will be out of circulation for a long time. Expense account item six, $26.05. Train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total... $64.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and See how the good chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Don Sanford with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Howard McNear, Parley Bear, Jeanette Nolan, Virginia Gregg, Dick Ryan, and John McIntyre. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network.